Good morning. I know that COVID fatigue is setting into your life, if it is just like mine and my family. Uh, these are difficult times and so many people are coming down, it seems, in this third wave, they call it, uh, as we've heard from Queen's Park and throughout Canada. But this is the day the Lord has made. And we try in Easter time on this third Sunday of the Easter season to look up and to find some joy and happiness there because this is a day when I'm going to be talking a little bit about the supernatural, that which is beyond explanation, the inexplicable part of what it is to believe in the resurrection faith. And it isn't easy. And I want to reflect with you on the disciples themselves who find this a very difficult thing to take in. And yet it changed their lives and it changes our life too. Interestingly enough, there are more people in the world who believe in the inexplicable, the supernatural, than are beginning to believe in basic religious principles. So this is a journey I want to take with you today and talk a little bit about it. Let us pray. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia, the Lord is risen. O come, let us worship. Christ our Passover is from 1 Corinthians. Alleluia, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death has no longer dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. The third Sunday of Easter, Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. The word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Good morning. Before I read the epistle lesson this morning, I would like to share the event that Peter was addressing in the scripture I'm going to read today. Peter and John had just arrived at the temple and found a beggar on the steps. This man had been lame since birth and spent his day asking for money. Peter explains that he and John don't have any money, but asks that the man look at them. 
He then says, I give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I order you to get up and walk. Then he took him by his right hand and helped him up. And the man was healed. And the crowd was amazed. The lesson this morning is taken from Acts. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself stood among his disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified, and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Throughout this time of isolation, and it seems that it goes on forever and ever, my wife and I have uh, taken time to watch mysteries together. 
we're kind of amateur sleuths. We try to figure out what's happening in a mystery story. We've gone through several of the television shows that are mysteries, and right now we're on one called Castle. And Castle is a writer who's just solving mysteries with uh, a young woman who happens to be a policewoman. One of the things I've learned in watching mysteries, and a great deal of mysteries over these last few months, is that the people that seem to be too good to be true are in fact not true. In other words, when people seem to be so good, you've got to wonder why, what's going on here? Because mysteries are sort of built around what you call red herrings. People that you think might be bad, but turn out not to be bad. People you think that are good, who turn out not to be good. And you've got to watch out for those people like the clergy, and the scout leaders, and the teachers, and all those people who you think are going to be good people. Because somewhere along the way, they may be the perpetrators of some terrible crime along the way. So we've always learned that all of those things are, are never quite what you, they seem. And things that never seem quite what they seem make a mystery really good. There is no greater mystery than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the deepest mystery you and I will ever involve ourselves in because we're looking constantly to find out how could this have happened? What happened on that day? How did Jesus come back from the dead? The disciples had seen him raised several times, but in the scripture today, the gospel lesson, he has come before them again. And in coming before them again, he's, he's standing in their midst, and they're absolutely in shock. We know they're in shock. They're kind of gaping their mouths, agog almost at what's in front of them. And there's so much in there that they're unaware of that they even forget to do the basics of what I call basic Middle Eastern hospitality, and that is to offer him something to eat. And in this story, Jesus says to them finally, are you going to offer me something? Could, could I have a little broiled fish? And finally, that sort of they come out of their stupor and say, oh, yeah, yeah. But they're still not convinced. They're still wondering. And he asks them, do you think I'm a ghost? Do you think I'm a ghost? Well, Ivy Bray was a woman who played the organ in one of my first parishes up north. And Ivy was one of those people who believed in hospitality. I mean, if you went to visit Ivy, she'd always pull out the tea or the coffee and lots of cakes and cookies and, you know, all kinds of things. It was a joy to visit her, and I must have put on pounds over the years that I worked in the North with Ivy. Uh, but Ivy also said, you know, you poor guy, you've got to drive 45 miles to my point and 45 miles back, and you may miss your dinner or you may be late for your dinner at home, and Leslie's got to look after our young kids at that time and she must be busy doing other things. So I tell you what, once a week when you're over here, uh, several days a week, I will cook for you a, a nice meal. And she said, what's your favorite meal? And I said, you know, my favorite, and I don't expect it from you, mind you, but is roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, mashed potatoes, gravy, and all those kind of things. Well, she surprised me, because the first time and every week after that, I got roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, mashed potatoes, gravy, I got a full good meal. Now hospitality is something that in the Middle East was very much demanded of people. If you came to visit someone, and you remember this from the story about Matthew the tax collector, Jesus invites himself to dinner. Well, people were expected to provide for you a meal, provide for you food, provide something. And in the old days when I started visiting people, in, in, when I was first ordained, that was very much part of your visit. People would put on the coffee pot or the teapot and they would feed you with some cookies and cakes and things like that. That was kind of the norm, the idea of hospitality. Um, it was always given that the clergy were fed and looked after. And Jesus is kind of wondering why they're not offering him something. Why, why are they standing there not just gazing at him? Um, they've forgotten you know, who he is and what he's doing. And in that, they say, he says to them, you know, do you think I'm a ghost? Do, do you think that I'm not real? And part of the answer to that is by eating the fish in front of them, he proves he's not a ghost. He's not something that's come out of nowhere. Now, ghosts are interesting. They're mentioned as early in the Bible as in the book of Samuel, that in fact, Saul calls Samuel back from the dead to find out what's going on. 
And Saul, you know, Samuel's not pleased because he comes back basically as a ghost. And here you have ghosts mentioned again. So ghosts have been around, the idea of ghosts have been around for thousands of years, that somehow people have believed in ghosts. Now, interestingly enough, I looked up on my computer, 45% of North Americans believe in ghosts. 45%, that's nearly half North American people believe in ghosts. And they're more likely to believe in the supernatural than they are in something that is natural. And what I mean by that is orthodox religion is no longer growing, but in fact supernatural <laughs> religious ideas are growing. The idea that somehow there are spiritual things out there that we can't touch or know, that has grown. And there are even TV programs. I watched one one day that was so fascinating to me about these men and women who go chasing ghosts. It, it's not Ghostbusters, not that movie, but, but men and women who have all kind of electronic gear and they go to these haunted homes or old inns or houses and they turn on all these switches and they listen for temperature changes in the room and they listen for some kind of knocking or movement or the breeze of somebody passing by them and they're sure that somehow this place or that place has ghosts. And it reminded me of a story, my, one of my roommates at university, uh, Greg, um, was one of these people who told me a ghost story once that was fascinating. His cousin was an actress called Kim Novak. Now, I don't know if you know Kim Novak. She was an actress back in the 50s and 60s, um, but she made some movies. Kim Novak bought the home of Clifton Webb. Clifton Webb was an actor again, an uh, early actor in terms of uh, parts that he took. And Clifton Webb's house, she took over and she would sleep at night and sometimes she'd wake up and Clifton Webb was sitting at the end of her bed, the ghost of Clifton Webb, obviously. And this ghost was always there. And it didn't harm her or bother her completely or, you know, but she went to a friend and finally said, you know, what am I gonna do? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of feeling upset that I wake up in the middle of the night and there's the ghost of Clifton Webb at the end of my bed. And the friend said, look, he was a ham actor. So you just say to him, Clifton, you are a ham actor, get out of my bed area and don't come back. And according to my friend Greg, that worked. So Kim was able to, Kim Novak, get rid of the ghost of Clifton Webb by just calling him a ham actor and, you know, get out of my bed and get out of, get out of, out of my life. Well, there are even celebrities. There's one program on that's called Celebrity Ghost Stories. And I've just looked at that very briefly and think to myself, wow, um, how true is this? I don't know. I have no idea. But Jesus wants his disciples to understand he's not a ghost. He's not something that is, can pa he does pass through walls, he does pass through locked doors, but he's not a ghost. In fact, he's real. He can eat fish. Um, he can say to Thomas, put your hand in my side, put your, you know, put your finger through my, my hands to see where I was crucified. So it's kind of indeterminate. You know, what exactly is this? This is something beyond the natural, but it's not a ghost. How do you explain it? Well, you know, as I say, one of the greatest mysteries that we'll never solve is the resurrection of Jesus. How does it happen? How does he do it? How does somebody pass through a locked door and yet you can touch his wounds and he can eat fish in front of you? You and I live in the 21st century and it's a time of science and reason and all of those things. And yet during this COVID-19, some in interesting things have happened. One of them I was reading about the other day is the sighting of UFOs has increased by over 200%. The sighting of unidentified flying objects has increased by 200%. People are looking up at the skies, I guess they've got nothing else to do at night, and they're seeing these UFOs, these unidentified flying objects, and they're wondering what's going on. And we know that somehow also in this period of time, people have become more and more absolved, you know, involved in their television sets and more involved in finding out um, all kinds of things. Um, young people are very prone to believe, it says that something like 60% of young people believe in demons, believe in demons. And that kind of scares me a little bit because I think, wow, they believe in demons. That's a pretty scary idea that there are demons out there that they actually do believe in. And of course, all these programs about zombies um, are a little bit proliferating constantly of, uh, on TV. And I don't even bother to watch them because they look so awful. But somehow they're popular with young people.
Some things defy logic and explanation. And I think that's what a mystery is. It defies logic and explanation sometimes. Now, the wonderful thing about mystery stories is you can eventually solve them. But the mystery of the resurrection, I don't know that you and I will ever solve. It is beyond our ken. It's beyond our understanding. And God is beyond our understanding. I mean, one of the wonderful things that happens in the book of Moses is that God, Moses says to God, I want to see you. And God says, you can't see me and live. You can't see me, God, and live. And so he says, you get up in a crevice and see me as I pass by. You can see the back of me as I go by. Well, that's about it. You know, God is inexplicable himself or herself or whatever God is. And you and I can't see God and live, and we can't explain God easily. I mean, maybe you can explain demons because they're on TV or, you know, zombies or ghosts or all of these different things. Maybe it makes us, you know, a little bit eerie and unsure. And we like the supernatural. We want to think about that. But God's love is beyond the supernatural. Maybe it's the truth of the matter is that love can pass through locked doors. That love can stand in front of us and say, see, I have suffered for you and I love you. And maybe love can also say, I accept your hospitality and if you can't give it to me, I'll take it. Because, you know, I can eat in front of you and be in front of you and you've got to know that I'm real. That I have come back from the dead. That love will never die. That love is the greatest mystery of all. God so loved the world. God so loved you. He gave you his only son. On this the Easter tide that you and I are celebrating, we have to believe there is something beyond reason and science, and that is the power of love to change your life and to change mine. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers today, when I say, for this let us pray to the Lord, please respond, Lord have mercy. In this season of Easter, when we seek resurrection and new life in ourselves and in our lives, we begin with the welcoming prayer by Father Thomas Keating, a Catholic contemplative. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome everything that comes to us today because we know it's for our healing. We welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. We let go of our desire for power and control. We let go of our desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. We let go of our desire for survival and security. We let go of our desire to change any situation, condition, person, or ourselves. We open to the love and presence of God and God's action within. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We continue with a prayer of thanksgiving for the life of the Duke of Edinburgh from Archbishop Linda Nichols, Primate of the Anglican Church of Canada. God of eternal life and love, we give thanks for the life and witness of Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, for his service in pursuit of peace as a naval officer, for his service to the Queen as a wise counselor and companion, for his commitment in marriage for over 70 years in witness to mutual respect and love, for his commitment to nurturing family and guiding with wisdom their growth and development, for his encouragement of young people around the world to skill development, physical health, adventure and service through the Duke of Edinburgh Award, for his care and advocacy for all of creation, 
for a life lived selflessly in service to others. We remember with thanksgiving and commit him into your keeping this day in the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Today's gospel tells us when Christ appeared to his disciples, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. May we and all who seek God find in the scriptures healing, guidance, and the good news of God's love for us. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the world in which we live, for all of creation, the land, the people, and all living creatures. We repent that we are not good stewards of creation. We repent that we do not love ourselves as you love us, and that we do not love others as ourselves. Today we pray for the nation and people of Myanmar, and for all nations who are at war, as written by the Secretary General of the Worldwide Anglican Communion. Lord of the heavens and the earth, we give you thanks and praise for the rising from the dead of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the never-ending love he offers us all. Grant, we pray, resurrection life to the nation and peoples of Myanmar, that sadness may turn into joy, aggression into hope, and anxiety into calm, that the people may be reconciled. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those who are ill and for the doctors and nurses and all who care for them, that they will be restored to health and wholeness according to your will for them. We pray for those who have died and for all those who mourn, including the royal family, in the words of our primate. Grant, O Lord, to all who are bereaved the spirit of faith and courage, that they may have the strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience, not sorrowing as those without hope, but in thankful remembrance of your great goodness and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the church and its work to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. For all who are hungry, who are without a home, who are alone, who are persecuted for what they are or believe or do, that we may demonstrate this message with our words and our behavior. You are not alone. You are not forgotten. You are not abandoned. We are praying and working towards a world where there is no more poverty or injustice or oppression, where all people can live in peace and are free to be who they are. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. God of new life, we thank you for your love that no matter what we have done, you continue to hold out your arms to us in love, that you accept us for who we are as we are. As we read your word and pray, help us to hear and accept your invitation to be in relationship with you, to open our bodies and minds and hearts for you to live in us, that we will both lie down and sleep in peace, assured of our safety in you. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. Alleluia. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit, make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. For life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day 
and every day. Amen.